people say here on Times Radio, I never know what time it is. I'm here at so many different times. Uh, what did I talk to you about a little minute ago about messing up in front of the man who's sat behind a radio Good mic morning. for decades and decades? Chris Tarrant, welcome Thank to Times Radio. Whenever people say things like decades, I think there's an old boy coming in, sort of being wheeled in, so, oh, come on, Mr. T. <laughs> <laughs> well, your book that you're here to talk about, mm -hmm. it's not a proper job. Stories from 50 years in TV. So, yes, OK. So you kind of landed yourself yeah, in okay. it. Okay, there is that. <laughs> uh, look, you've had a stellar career. Let's just give you a bit of an introduction before we go into the detail. Uh, in the 1970s, you established yourself at the forefront of groundbreaking Saturday morning TV as the producer and host of the kids' show Tis Was. You went on to present the Capital Radio breakfast show for 17 years, Chris, and then spent 16 years fronting Who Wants to Be a Millionaire? And, of course, you've crossed the globe for extreme railway journeys as well. I think it's been a, a very eclectic career and one that we'll talk through now. Um, the beginning of the book, uh, and I didn't know this fact about you, I know it's been reported before, but in 1971... You wrote to pretty much every single British TV company. It was. I mean, there weren't as many as there are now, but I wrote this dreadful letter. What did it say? Well, among other phrases about how clever I was and how good I was and how they should employ me, it said, um, I am the face of the 70s. This is your chance to snap me up. <laughs> you didn't think about what might happen in no. the 80s. Well, most of them. <laughs> most of them point. had a good sense. I mean, they do this thing about, dear Sir Stroke, madam, thank you so much for your letter, which we all read. Uh, we have no vacancy at the moment. We will, of course, keep your letter on file, which means the dustbin, basically. The, yes, of course it does. There's no yes. file. Yes, and for All some of us reason, have been there. Yeah, for some reason, ATV Birmingham and uh, Yorkshire up in Leeds both invited me to, you know, come for an interview. I think just see what sort of weirdo wrote this book, uh, this letter, this tome. So ATV offered me a week's work um, on their magazine show. Now, this, it just, it's only when I started writing it, I thought, God, I was so laid back. Or brazen, um, which I think laid back. I mean, I was fishing basically in Dorset. I did a lot of fishing. I was living down in Dorset. I was fishing on the Dorset Stour just about every day. I was living with my first wife. We were very happy by the seaside. Uh, and I got this job offer in, in October, early October, actually, in 71. Um, and I, I just kept saying, oh, I'm, thank you so much, and I'm very excited about it, but I'm just real. I kept saying I'm writing a screenplay, which is complete nonsense. I was fishing. <laughs> <laughs> and I kept but you putting actually it kept off that on, didn't know, it? Up for six it months. Up. I know. Until you finally they arrived. Find, well, they got to the point sometime after Christmas when they said, look, we've got a week's work here, but, you know, if you're going to muck about, we're really going to have to give... Oh, no, 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 I'm nearly ready. I'm nearly finished my screenplay. And if you see my first ever contract, uh, you need to know that the river fishing season ends on March the 14th. My first ever contract with ATV Today Birmingham started on March 15th, 1972. There you go. But isn't that... I don't know what that says about me, that I'm just so unambitious or disinterested well, or Well, I don't know whether, or... whether you were unambitious or you just had, as you say, you might have been very laid back or you might just have been very confident and sure that it would happen at some point I along the way. I just don't think I cared. It wasn't, it wasn't a career thing. I thought that would be fun for yeah. know, a week or two and then I was there for several years. Yes, yeah. So you went to Associated TV in the Midlands and you kind of broke your ground, really, as a TV reporter. You were mm. reporting on quite serious things. I was useless. I was absolutely... Yes. And that's hard. Don't uh, say yes like well, that. Yes, especially, well, actually, you say this was, in the book. I was You were hopeless. useless at the serious Because well, I was doing all these shop stewards and, you know, union officials and local politicians. I, mean, it was, I, I just didn't like them. And it was very obvious, which is not the sort of, you know, how you're supposed to do it. Um, and I mean, they could have dumped me after about two weeks and I thought they're probably going to get rid of me or... You know, I can't go fishing now till June, so what am I going to do? <laughs> um, and um, they started saying, well, we'll try on the lighter items, and I have. So all those weirdos, eccentrics, call them what you will, the, you know, the upside-down beer drinker, I, I interviewed a soot juggler, I interviewed a man who swallowed light bulbs, uh, a man who put rats down his trousers, a man who lived in uh, a house, with a, a quite a small house in Wolverhampton with a Shetland pony, <laughs> and he was the nicest man, <laughs> lovely old boy. And this pony was a beautiful animal. The house just stank. Uh, oh, another I'm sure man who spent did. three days and nights with a pigeon on his head. I just did all that. Yeah. So when this little children's television program came around and they were looking at sort of wandering lunatic with long hair, they thought, "I know, <laughs> we'll try that tarot bloke." So did and they? That changed my life really. Did they approach mm. you to do Tis Was? Mm. So you hadn't applied. No. Someone had spotted you, obviously. Then somebody got whatever's one <laughs> of them. Spotted this ingenious well, my, local TV my reporter mum and dad, because it, because it was in the Midlands and mum and dad lived in the south. They'd never seen me. They thought they were going to see this sort of hard news investigative reporter, and they, unbeknown to me, after I'd been there for about 
six or eight months, they snuck into Woodstock, which is in the ATV Midland area, to watch their boy on television. And unfortunately that day, I was interviewing a man walking from Worcester to Evesham, which is a distance of about 13 miles, with four ferrets down his trousers. <laughs> and after about a mile, they bit him, and all <laughs> hell was breaking loose in his wife runs. And then, I mean, to the, to the horror or delight of every woman in the Midlands, this ferret, I can see this blooming thing now, it stuck its little pink nose out of his trouser Oh, no. <laughs> it's like, no, no, no. And my mum and dad are going, oh, my God. What is God, this? this is what is this? What's he doing? You know, also at that time, it's fair to say that alcohol was part of the culture. It certainly was. At TV studios mm. and stations. There we was, all did. Yeah. Yeah, I, mean, of course. I was never, I was never ever drunk on television. Okay, ever. just but after. We just topped up, just after certainly, but we, we just kept quietly topping up. Quite often, it was the live, and it was the thing in the mornings before you went filming or whatever. Uh, weird now, but I, I mean, most of the best ideas certainly that I had for Tis was particularly, mm. but but other things. Well, and actually, some of the some of the ideas for Millionaire years later came from bars. I mean, London Weekend had a splendid bar where all sorts of programmes were dreamed up, you know? BBC had a fantastic bar. There are always bars. So and that's all gone. They closed them. Would you argue that it's a bit of a shame that yeah. that bar culture doesn't exist yeah. and that people aren't allowed to kick oh, back within the workplace? Everybody, everybody drinks water. Yes, oh, yeah. Sake. Well, that's the same in the paper industry as I well, know. of course. Um, did you, at any point, have a problem with alcohol? Would, would you ever have no, put yourself actually, down to someone who kind no. of needed the alcohol afterwards to no, be I able to actually. relax I or just, anything? No, not really. I mean, I just liked it, you know? Mm. I mean, I know Bob Monkhouse, bless him, always said to me, I was talking about it once, and he said, just have one big glass of wine, because I like red wine and Bob did. He said, just have one big glass of red wine before you go on. He said, don't have any more. You'll think you're funny. You'll think your time is good, but it won't be. I'd be useless if I had a glass of red wine before I went on. Like, yeah, of course had. I would. I one now. <laughs> um, no, that was his thing for doing, like, like a, obviously, Millionaire later and other light entertainment shows I did. And then have as much as you like when you finish, which is like what I did for years. Do you think it was a period of excess? Um, yes, actually. For good or for bad? Um, in my case, for bad. Not because... Not because I was reeling around the streets. I just drank, drank too much for too long. And in the end, like about 10 years over now, I keeled over. And when I came round after a couple of weeks, and very nice. Is this the incident on the plane? Yeah, yeah. we had a stroke on we the had plane, a which was pretty damn scary, to be honest. At 30, I thought I was going to die. I was 39,000 feet. Nobody to talk to. And coming from Bangor, I was filming. I was wrecked. I'd come from Bolivia to Burma to Myanmar to Bangkok, whatever. I was going home. I was just sort of keeled over. And I didn't... I don't know, it's that very British thing. We were going from Bangkok to London, right? 14 hours, whatever. And I just thought, I, I don't really want... This is pathetic. I don't want to make a fuss. It's a very British thing. I don't, and no, none of them have spoken any English. And also, I've seen those things where, you know, they put a plane down. Now, you look at the map from Bang <laughs> Bangkok to London. Where would you like to be put down? Would you choose Afghanistan? Would, it, would Iran be your favourite? Iraq? I mean, there's nowhere. I just wanted to get to London, see my missus, see my kids, yeah. whatever, and get home. And I was all right. I kept, it kept coming and going. And then eventually we got Heathrow, who were fantastic. I mean, I have bad mouth at the airport over the years. They were fantastic. Paramedics came out of nowhere. There was an ambulance mm. came out of nowhere. Mm. Um, they told my driver and my, my lady to shoot over to Hammersmith Hospital. I'd see them there and all that. But when I left, I said to this very nice consultant bloke, I said, thank you so much. You probably saved my life. And he said, well, you know, you weren't in a bad way. And I said, um, what caused it then? And he looked at me. This is why I'm telling you this. He went, excess. And I said, do you mean excess, Dr. Sharma? He went, excess, excess, excess. Ooh. So I thought, well, that'll be excess then. Yeah. So, I mean, it wasn't just booze. It was everything, just, you know. What burn else it, was it? I mean, I mean, every conceivable okay. end and all that stuff. Being busy? Yeah, being busy, travelling ridiculous, yeah. you know, journeys and all that. It was, it was very silly. And you've had... But also you get this thing you're kind of indestructible. I think a lot of blokes have Yeah. That, you know. Well, also, you've had such a high-intensity career. Yeah. And we'll obviously talk kind of more about that. But, you know, from Tis Was, onto Capital Radio, onto Millionaire, mm. you were an expert in, you know, incredibly intensive decades plus yeah. of work. Mm. And it doesn't feel like you ever really stopped because even after Millionaire or alongside Millionaire, there, were the, the, um, there was the extreme railway journeys yeah. as well, which involved a lot of travel. Somebody worked out we've travelled nine times around the globe. No wonder I'm knackered. <laughs> <laughs> but where did, that, where did that mentality come from, that you always needed to be, to I think be doing just something? I mean, one of the things in the book, I mean, 
we are blessed. You are blessed. I am blessed. We're really lucky to do what we yeah, do. We are. It is not a proper job. And Wogan, bless him, said to me once, I've never done a day's work since I left the bank in Dublin. And I know what he meant. I've never not looked forward to a day's work. I know so many people who hate their job, you know, hate the travel to their job, hate their boss, hate going home, probably hate their kids when they get home, and they have to do it because yeah. they've got lots and lots of bills. A load of people like that. Reflecting. I've never, I've loved it. So what I'm saying is the sort of thing that drove me on is actually pleasure, you know? Do you think you stop to enjoy it enough? I have now. Yeah, but... I'm in a really good place now, and, mm. and I do enjoy my life. I can certainly cut down a load of work. And, I mean, Capital Radio was one of the, probably the best fun of my life, but getting about five o'clock every morning and then going straight to someone like Millionaire and maybe a couple of other shameless earners mm. in the middle, you know, voiceovers or commercials, whatever. Doing that for a long time, it's not really clever. But it's what you do. It's like, this is my peak earning potential. Yeah, you have to enjoy career. it. This is what we do, you know? Is it right that at, that at your peak at Capital Radio, the first hour of your show, the breakfast show, six till seven, paid for your entire salary yes. in advertising yes. revenue? Yes, yes. Wow. I know, it's bizarre. And, um, I mean, the breakfast show actually affected the share price and all that. And a lot of the, um, the senior managers, whatever, at Capital Radio at that time, they all made a fortune on shares. So it was terribly important to them that it kept going. And I did... Um, I did sort of negotiate quite hard for the last few years. It was like, no, oh, I think I've really had enough. And they go, oh, you can't do that, the share price. Well, it's not my fault, the share price. <laughs> it's, not, it's not fair, that is it. Whether it's Evans or Wogan, it's not fair to blame the share price on the presenter. It that's, happens in America. Yeah, and that's either an awful lot of pressure yeah. or it would fuel your ego, presumably. Yeah, wouldn't was... it? If someone said to me that this business relies on you doing what you do and please don't leave, I'd feel pretty important about yeah, that. Yeah, but... I'm kind of not like that. I just had a very nice time. As long as I was mm. having a nice time, if everybody was making money, including me, they paid me lots. And they kept paying me a lot more lots. And then it got to the point where he thought, I don't really want any more money. I just want more time off to, you know, yeah. keep in touch with my yeah. family, go on holiday, whatever. And I know Wogan negotiated like that after a while because he did lots of early mornings. He said, you know, bless him, he's one of my heroes. He said, there's no point getting any more money. You just pay tax and whatever. He said, take more weeks off. There's a story from Richard Park who said that you came into Capital Radio one day to find the record library had been recatalogued. Do you remember this? So instead of searching for artists by name, they all had long digit catalogue numbers. Oh. And apparently you were so annoyed about oh. it. What I, did you do? I drove in <laughs> and Richard Allenson, bless him, who was doing the early, you know, four till six, whatever. And Richard is the most lovely, unflappable guy in the world. And he's obviously on it, really fed up, and he's going, I'm not quite sure what that record was. And anyway, they were very good. And I got in, I said, Richard, what's happened? And there was a period when they were obsessed with DJs not really having any control of the music at all. It didn't sort of supposedly affect me. But what they'd done on all the records, they just put CD1, CD2, CD... So I started saying, well, it's a nice record, CD1. Uh, and playing CD2 now, and people are going, what's, what are you talking about? <laughs> Parky came in ranting, said, what's going on? I said, I cannot do this job. Look, it's ridiculous. Top 20, CD1, CD... Don't even know the name of the artist, yeah. whatever. And he went roaring out and spoke to the, uh, the offending executive and suddenly, magically... Yes, all right, that was, that was a use of power, but it wasn't abuse of power, it had to be no, it nonsense. No, you were making... There was a period when they were, they were complete... I think they've calmed down a bit now, I don't know, I'm not there. But they were kind of obsessed with, you know, records, certain records had to be played every hour on the hour, and it's actually very boring, that constant rotation, mm. rotation. It's pretty tedious. Set kind of playlists as well. well I, yeah, all that. And I remember saying to one of the guys who was sort of head of music for a very nice chap, but he was about 10, and I said to him, um, well, certainly was Rod Stewart record like. And he went, oh, we've got a 6.2. And I went, yeah, OK, so what's, what's it like? Is it, you know, is it slow? Is it fast? Is it a love song? You know, is, is it Rod at his very best? Does it make the hair stand out? He went, oh, it's a 6.2. And I thought, oh, God, you lost the plot, mate. <laughs> what, is the, what, is, what is a 6.2? Uh, look, we'll hear more from broadcasting legend Chris Tarrant in just a moment. This is Kate Borsley in for Mariella Fostrop on Times Radio. He's written a book. It's called It's Not a Proper Job. Don't say it like that. He's from written a book. He's written a book. In Real crayon. <laughs> uh, stories from 50 years in TV. Um, let's talk about Tis Was mm -hmm. and the fact that it was new, it was revolutionary. Mm -hmm. um, what was it? It what broke all the rules. Broke every rule. Broke every rule going. Mm -hmm. And you at that time, I think, well, and, and probably afterwards as well, sort of criticised the safety of Blue Peter Swap shop, of course, on the, the, uh, on the rival channel. Exactly, safe and two oh, tweet. God, oh. What do you think of the wider broadcasting sort of view now? Do well, I'm a bit worried that we might be going back. 
Right, OK. The whole woke thing is beginning to really bug me. I don't think... I, I mean, Tiss was could not happen now. Tiss was a tremendous success, very commercially successful, much loved, hugely loved by people who watched it at the time a few years ago now. Um, and I don't think we could do it. We did a Tiswas reunion thing about five years ago on ITV. And it was fine. It was very funny. And Sir Lenny, Sir Lenny as he is now, always amused me. Uh, Lenny was on great form. We had a great night. But, I, I mean, with my producer's hat on again, I had to go, no, we can't just have two inches of water in a bucket. It won't work. And all this stuff, you know, which, which we never had when we, when we did it. We did it for eight years. Mm. But I, I must admit, doing the book, I mean, I've looked at a lot of photos, some very strange photos of me, looking clearly a bit unhinged. But also, um, just the state of the studio. and the, You remember the cage we used to put in the corner full of adults? <laughs> and these people would just get, they'd get their hair done, they'd get their best new yeah, frock on. And, yeah. and we would just obliterate them. And then them you put them in a cage, yes. seconds. <laughs> and it was like, did you see me this morning? So the kids said, no, Mum, we couldn't, we couldn't make out which one was you. <laughs> so you think now perhaps we're too politically correct? We well, certainly. And what do you think about, you know, stations like GB News and Talk TV who are well, trying well, to disrupt trying, it a they? little bit? They're trying. Thank God for anybody who's trying. It's become, it's become all a bit too... I don't know. And then some of the... Uh, I, I'm not sure where the light entertainment's going on, on on all the channels. I mean, have you seen The Masked Singer? I it's have. I have seen The Masked shocking. Singer, but it's ridiculous. Yeah, and and, and maybe that's a good thing no, that it's, it's ridiculous. Not. No, it's not. It's just awful. The first one I saw, I was just looking at it like a road crash, and people like Jonathan are on it, and David and people think, "What are you doing?" And the, the way he took the mask off, it was Eddie the Eagle Edwards. Now. <laughs> Most people would not re recognise Eddie the Eagle Edwards when he <laughs> when he failed at the Olympics 40 years ago or whatever. I thought, this this is never going to fly, this thing. And now they're on about the masked uh, dancer. There is the masked dancer now. And what's yeah. next? The masked yeah. cook? Yes. The masked knife sharp? I mean, it just seems to be... <laughs> there's, a, there's a hint of desperation. And the other thing is, and I'm sorry, but I'm ranting on about this a bit this week, very highly paid television executives, some of whom I know well and some of whom are my friends, go on these all-expenses-paid trips, particularly to Los Angeles and America and San Francisco, looking at American television. And they come back and they go, I know what we'll do, we'll bring back another series of family fortunes. You think, oh, God's sake. So a lack of inventiveness, so a lack much, of creativity. Yes, so much of it. Yeah. And it's either bringing back family fortunes or it's the masked <laughs> the mask carpenter. The masked, yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, let's talk about Millionaire. Mm. Tell us how that came about, because... Uh, originally, well, I think you turned it down, didn't you, a few times? Sort of. Um, yeah, I, David Briggs was my close friend, still my close friend, um, and produced the radio show with me for years. And, you know, we, people always say, you two sort of, you're joined at the hip, we always think the same way and whatever. So we did a thing on radio, on Capital, called Double or Quits, where you started at a pound, you went up two pound, four pound, and you could see how very quickly the money went up. But they always pulled out, they got to £100, went, I said, Chris, I've got enough, and, you know, whatever. So David went off to seek his fortune in the big, bad world of television, and, and surprisingly, for a while, he really struggled. And I said to him, you can always come back to radio. He said, I don't know, but I really want to get the few things working. Yeah. He said, look, I've got this, this TV sort of pilot I'm trying to make, basically of double or quits. There's a thing called Cash Mountain. I went, oh, yeah, good luck. He said, no, no, no. He said, I really want you to do it. I said, well, I'm really busy. And this is where it's pathetic really I said look I'm really busy mate you know I'm, I was just about doing another series of talent on TV I was supposed to be doing something in America um I was busy every day obviously on Capital Radio etc etc and I said look I'll do a pilot but you know so you can hawk it around the network but I, I don't think I'll do a series I'm just too busy and he said the only other person I know on television at all from from Capital is, is Kenny Everett and he said it would have been fun if Kenny did it <laughs> can you imagine all done in the best possible I mean it would have been wonderful it would been very different um and I said, look, I'll do a pilot, but, you know, then you've got it. You've got a sort of shape of a show to show to controllers. Because ITV had already turned it down once. They then had a new controller. Anyway, we did the pilot, and I remember sitting there thinking, this is actually quite good, I quite like this. It's such a simple idea. Yes. That's yeah. why it's so good. Yeah. I mean, it's now sold 121 countries, I think, around the world. I mean, that whole thing of the lifelines is obvious. You, you get it straight away. You just understand it straight away. Um, I think that the great thing about it, there's a lot of great things about it, is the idea of having the answers on the screen. So, you know, you're so playing the for audience 32, so and, it's there. And the viewers play yeah. along with yeah. you. And there's that multiple and choice element, that of course. Yeah. It's like yeah. there was a, one that Bob did called 64,000 something dollar, or whatever. But you didn't know what the next question was. You just said, yeah, I feel lucky, Chris, I'm going to play and all that. Mm. So they could actually see it. I think that's brilliant. Everywhere it's gone around the world, 
it's gone to number one everywhere. Yeah. Every, every, because of it its might simplicity. be it might be a, it might be a month. It might be yeah. you know, three months. Whatever. Every, I think it's still huge in places like Australia. Um, Probably the best known contestant. This won't surprise you that I'm asking you about Major Charles Ingram. Um, what do you remember of the recording? W- was there any suspicion? No, I've always by said you. That. No, no. I'm quite an intelligent bloke. I, I genuinely didn't. And yeah. nor did David Briggs. I mean, my producer in, yeah. in the back, he didn't spot anything. Because there was suspect coughing, of course. Yeah, but in a television studio... You don't hear and, that. And really. that, particular, that particular show with him was unbelievable. I mean, just as a piece of entertainment. Because he's, you know, people are screaming, no, are you mad? He kept on saying, oh, I've no idea. I don't know. Oh, God. And I'm going... He's a British Army major, probably not on a huge amount of money in rented accommodation. got three kids. He wants to buy them pony. And it's like... You know, you could lose a hundred thousand pounds. Yes, I know. Oh God, crash and burn. Keep, and people were screaming. They were gasping. They were applauding. Everything. And you liked and, him. And they would be coughing. Mm. I sort of liked him. I just thought he was mad. I mean, I, I just thought he's a bit of a nutty, you know, because he, he was. I thought he's one of those guys. I was completely wrong, but I thought he's one of those guys who charges down mountains, leading his men <laughs> with a machine gun. So come on, he kept saying, "Come on, crash and burn." <laughs> he had one lifeline left after four thousand pounds. I mean, that's not the stuff of million pound winners at all. No. And when he got to the million, I've always remembered this as well. If I say to you, Kate, you've got five hundred thousand pounds. If you go for the next question, you get it right. You win a million pounds. Uh, but if you do go for it and get it wrong, you can take £500,000. If you go for it and get it wrong, you lose £450,000. Now, even Branson and McCartney are going to go, oh, crap. It's just not and the like only that, person yeah. ever, only one ever, who, who didn't blink at all. And it's only hindsight. Weeks later, of I course. thought, God, he, didn't, he went, yes, OK, come on, let's play. Because he knew he was going to play. He knew he was going to get the right yeah. answer. It was quite a saga. But I left. I went up to the director's box and said, great, weird guy, but won a million quid. He went, no, I'm not sure. Not. I said, what do you mean? Just giving him a check for a million quid? Yeah. yeah. Went, mm. And they stayed behind. Paul Smith, the boss of Celador, the company I own it, came, came up. David Briggs stayed. And they ran through the whole tape saying, what's he doing? He's up to something. Mm. One of the sound men said there's weird noises. What's he, what's he doing? And then they ran it again. And about quarter to two, I mean, I know this, I went home and I was asleep. Um, about quarter to, to two in the morning, as a young editor said, there's a cough there. I went, what? I said, there's a cough. And they ran it back and went, oh, my God. And once you go through it, it's just all the way through. It, it, it is amazing. Mm. And on the, So the cheque, which I wrote out, mm. pay major £1 million, that is always dated for the show when it goes out, not the day it's recorded. So we recorded the show on a Monday. The show was due to go out on the Saturday. On Thursday, Paul Smith rang him, the most bizarre conversation. He said, uh, and Paul is very articulate, and very bright, and very intelligent. And he was like, uh, um, uh, uh. This is quite a weird thing to say. He said, uh, hello, Major. Oh, hello, Paul. How are you? Oh, well, I'm fine. Uh, um, uh, um. And he, he actually says, you know that million pounds you gave you on Monday? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yes, yes. He said, well, uh, um, uh, um, um, there are a few irregularities. We're not happy about it. And uh, we're going to stop the check. And the major, instead of going, you what, like you would, he went, oh, oh, well, I'll obviously have to talk to the legal chapters, but thanks for letting me know. Oh, right. Thanks for letting yeah, me know. Yes. Yeah, right. <gasps> so I think he was waiting for that call. Yeah. Or his wife was yeah. going to get. They had a, the other thing, they had a massive row straight after the show. They just won a million quid. They had a massive row in the dressing room, which is really weird. And no, my manager was outside and, and Eve, one of the lovely researchers, said he's just told me to... Go forth and multiply. What that, what that nice major mm. told her to go away. Right. Um, and they were having this great ding dong. And Paul, my manager, him and his said, wife were having a ding dong. Yeah. Yeah. She was screaming at him mainly. And we've always mm. thought, I wish we'd listen with a glass to the wall because we've no idea. But mm. we assume, and there's no basis for this in fairness, but we assume that she said, You've gone too far. If we'd come out at 125,000 or something. Yeah, that it would have looked, got away with it, looked more respectable. We could have run it yeah. in the family because yeah. they'd already had the brother and her on. Yeah. And they could have run it for yeah. years. Um, the book covers all the good times, mm. but you've been described as grumpy in what? the past. Yes. Who said that? Grumpy, a little bit shirty. Is that. Is that fair enough, though, for someone in such a public-facing job? You know, all of your roles are public-facing. Are you allowed to be a bit grumpy? I'm very rarely grumpy. No, seriously. Mm. I'm very sort of, what you see is what you get. Why do you think people say that, then? I don't know who they were. (laughs) Seriously. (laughs) Reports say. Well, all that. Mm. Not really. I'm not grumpy. I get tired like anybody else. Mm. I'm not particularly grumpy. And I think reflecting back on your career, is there... 
Is there one big moment of happiness there? Is there a big achievement or one thing that, I think, that you look um, back on and think yes, that, that's I it? Yes, I think undoubtedly, and it's right at the end of the book, I won the best light entertainment show or whatever for who wants to be a millionaire for the, you know, someone like the fifth time or whatever. Went out to meet the press, do the photos, holding up the award, very happy. Went back to sit next to David Briggs and co. And um, we're just chatting quietly. And I could hear Trevor, Sir Trevor in the background saying, someone whose career started in children's television. I'm thinking, oh, it's a bloke here, sort of you know, not unlike me. You know, I honestly wasn't listening. And then basically I got a Lifetime Achievement Award, which yeah. I was well made up. At the National Television yeah, Awards, yeah. Albert Hall. Yeah. And I was like, God, I had, yeah. no, I, I had no idea. I spoke to mum and dad in the morning. They said, good luck tonight, just for the, the normal award. And I said, yeah, I think we'll win. Like, hey, you win, mate. And, you know, give us a ring in the morning and all that. What I didn't know was at that point... Um, they were preparing this bloke as the Phantom Flanflinger, the man in black. Who From Tiswell's days, yeah. yeah. So Trevor said, congratulations, everybody clapped, and he said, there's just one more person who would like to give you his own personal greeting or something. And the Phantom Flanflinger came out, and I'm looking at this mask with these eyes, thinking, I know these eyes. I'm thinking, well, it's not Lenny. It's, it's obviously not Sally. I'm thinking, who is it? And then he took it off, and it was my dad. And I was like, oh, wow. Oh, man. Yeah. I was tears and everything. Yeah. It was extraordinary. Because, I mean, he was so wicked. When, when he said good luck tonight, he was actually getting in a car mm. for London Weekend Television. And I had no idea. And that, that was a one. We then turned, both, both of us were a bit like this, and I think a lot of the audience had tears as well. Mm. I mean, it was really emotional stuff. Because he was my hero. You know, this guy who survived Dunkirk and D-Day and blown up on a landmine in Germany and one of my, you know, my best friend for all my life. Was he addresses the fact? And we just turned to the Albert Hall, and it was just you know, it wasn't some I don't know, some working man's club. It was the Albert Hall, yeah. and it was standing up. I thought, yeah, it doesn't get better than that, it really doesn't. Uh, well, look, you Bless can you. read about that and more in Chris's book. Um, it's not a proper job, stories from 50 years in TV. It's out now, published by Great Northern Books. Chris Tarrant, thanks so much for speaking to us. Really thanks for joining it. us. Thank you, Kate Borsay here on Times Radio. 